What's up everybody, my name's Matt, and I wanna start by asking y'all a question. Who is an only child? Like, look around, who's the only, okay. Let's give them a hand. I just need you to know that we love you and that all of us are now your siblings. Now, who of the group is an oldest sibling? Meaning that every single sibling or step-sibling that you have is younger than you. Is who's in the room is that? All right, cool, got it. Now, which one of you is a middle child? You may have older siblings and younger siblings. Can I just say we see you, we notice you, you are seen in the middle and we are grateful for you. All right, now the last group, don't feel left out. I know that everything's always about y'all normally, so who's the baby in the family? All right, let's give it up for the youngest siblings in the room. Listen, it has its advantages and its disadvantages, and I know this because I'm the youngest. I actually grew up with a sister who's almost five years older than me. And so I had not only my mom, but in certain seasons of my life, another one. <laughs> and we would just get on each other's nerves sometimes. I remember being in sixth grade. My sister was in 11th grade. She just got in her car, learned how to drive. And one night, my little 11 year old heart was absolutely broken because some girl dumped me. And I remember laying in my bed singing Tony Braxton, Unbreak My Heart. Just laying in bed, it's dark and, unbreak my heart, say you love me again. And from my sister's room, I hear, Matt, shut up. It was like, <laughs> the little things that I would do that just annoyed her. But the next day at school, my sister knew how hurt I was. And when I walked out to the car rider line, she was sitting there in her car to pick me up. I guess the saying is true after all, blood is thicker than water. You ever heard that phrase? If not, it's okay, I'll explain it. It's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And here's what it means. Blood is thicker than water is used to say that someone's family ties are more crucial in their life than any other person, relationship, or need. For instance, it could mean that your bond with your friends is not as valuable as your bond with your family. In other words, in the list of important things in your life, family is right up there at the top. It's a big deal. It shapes us. It's a huge part of why we are who we are. Now, friends may come and go, especially as we get older, but your family will always be your family. And whether the members of your family are literally blood related or related by adoption or by marriage, they still represent some of the most important people in your life. Family plays a huge role in the story of you. And that's why we're talking about it for the next few weeks. Now, I realize that when I say family, that means something different for everyone. No family looks the same, acts the same, or shares the same story. For some of us, family means a mom and a dad. Some of us actually live with an aunt or an uncle. Some of us live with a stepmom, or we have a stepdad, or we live with our grandparents, or we have foster parents, or half siblings, or second cousins, and the list goes on. But even when families are structured, the same, they're still different because the people who make up that family are unique, including you. And because all families are unique, they bring their own unique sets of challenges. In fact, we're gonna talk about some of those challenges throughout this series. But one of them is that sometimes family can feel like, um, just a bit much. It can be a lot to manage sometimes, our family, and to juggle the reality of those relationships. And when it comes to family, there are a whole bunch of things in the mix. Think about it. There's a lot of personalities, there's a lot of needs, a lot of opinions, a lot of preferences, you got different schedules and activities, there's different attitudes and all the drama, there's a lot of noise, I got five kids, it's never quiet. There's just a lot of human beings in our families. And for some of you, the sheer number of people alone, is just a lot. And when you add all of these things on top of each other and you put them all under one or maybe even two roofs, it can be complicated. And so here's what's interesting. The whole God, church, Jesus, Bible thing can sometimes add another complication to your family dynamic as well. It's another preference, another opinion, and another part of your busy schedule. Faith becomes another thing to add on to the family mix. And while we would assume that it would only make things better, sometimes it doesn't. Maybe you feel confused because you're not sure how to live out your faith with your family. Maybe you're the only Christian in your household. And because you love your family, you'd love to see them develop a faith of their own. But how can you possibly influence them in a way that isn't just awkward? Maybe your mom or your stepdad expect you to act a certain way because you claim to be a Christian and there's a certain way that Christians are supposed to act. And honestly, it's just a lot of pressure. 
Maybe the adults in your household, because they care about you, maybe they take you to church when you act up or in hopes of you getting some positive guidance and direction. Maybe that's why some of you are even here today. But now what it does is it makes church feel like some part of a punishment or like it's some kind of religious detention. And maybe, maybe your faith is starting to look a little different than the people that you live with. You don't want to offend anyone by disagreeing, but the truth is you don't see eye to eye with them. And on every single aspect of faith, that just creates tension. Maybe faith has been a part of your family for a while. And when you look at your family, you're not sure that it's working and faith is talked about and prayers are prayed and churches attended, but the arguments or the tensions, they just aren't solved. Or maybe both of your parents claim to have faith, but how come now they're divorced? or they're separated. I mean, you love the people that you live with, or at least you like them sometimes, but it just doesn't seem like faith is solving any of your complicated issues. For a lot of us, it feels like faith is one part of the mix, but family is another, and they're totally separate, and they can't help or they can't change each other. But what would happen if we allowed our faith and our family to mix? Well, I think this entire series could be a game changer in the way you interact with your family forever. Now, the first four books of the New Testament are called the Gospels. They're the account of Jesus' life when he lived among us. And one of those Gospels is the book of John, written by one of Jesus' closest friends. And in the section that we're going to look at today, John records how Jesus and his disciples were sharing an important meal together. It was the Passover meal, which was a religious holiday. And the disciples didn't know that this was going to be Jesus' final meal with them, but Jesus did. And the disciples had spent years traveling with Jesus and living beside him. And there's no doubt that they actually felt far more like family than anything else. And Jesus understood that things were about to get extremely complicated and highly emotional for these guys because their leader was about to be killed and everything would change. And John says this, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And just like you love your complicated family, Jesus loved his disciples. They didn't do everything right, not by a long shot, <laughs> but Jesus still loved them. And knowing his time with them was coming to an end, watch what he did next. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a the towel that was wrapped around him. If you think this sounds kind of awkward now, you have no idea how awkward it was to the disciples. Even though foot washing was a common thing then, you can imagine how nasty feet would get walking along dirt roads in sandals. But Jesus was a teacher and a leader. He had authority and people in his position, they didn't wash other people's feet. That's what servants did. And so the disciples didn't know how to respond to Jesus' unbelievable act of kindness and service to them. And then Jesus went on to say this, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is saying, you remember what I just did a few minutes ago? How I acted like a servant and I washed your feet? How I humbled myself and chose to honor you? How I showed my love for you and then even when it felt awkward, I chose it anyways? I want you to go and show each other that same kind of love and service. And by doing that, everyone will know that you are my followers. See, how will people know that you are a follower of Jesus? What will show the people closest to you that you follow God? Well, it's simple, love. The disciples had no idea how loving it was for Jesus to wash their feet. Jesus even knew that one of his disciples would betray him. And one of his closest friends, Peter, would deny ever knowing him, even knowing that he would be hurt by them, Jesus still washed their feet. Jesus remained focused on love and he gave us an incredible example of what to do with the people that are closest to us. We are to love your friends, your teachers, strangers, and even your family will know that your faith is real by the way you love. When you do something kind, no one says thank you, love. When your older brother or sister act like a jerk toward you, love. When you feel like your 
parents made a decision that was unfair towards you, love. And so what does it look like to love in the middle of complicated family situations? Well, the apostle Paul would later write about love and he would tell us, he says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. If we were to ask Jesus or Paul what faith would look like in our complicated families, I think this is what they'd say. Let your faith in Jesus move you to love the people that you live with. Love with patience, love with kindness, love in a way that honors the people around you, love in a way that is slow to anger and doesn't keep a record of wrongs. In other words, if you want your faith to help your family, then show as much love as you can. It never fails. And even when you're not sure what you think about faith and you're still asking questions, it's still a great idea. Think about it this way. When it comes to our relationships, that are thicker than water, love is more important than anything. Let me show you what that looks like. So right here is every piece of 1 Corinthians 13, 4. I just want you to pick one of these and ask God to give you the power to start demonstrating that in your family. Why? Because these things don't make you a doormat. Mm -mm. They allow you to be a demonstration for God. I mean, how can you choose to be patient even when they frustrate you to no end? And you in that moment can still choose to be kind. Or maybe what you want to do whenever they do something against you is you just want to dishonor them with your words. But love doesn't dishonor because it's not self-seeking. It's not about you. And maybe you've been holding up this just rage because of this list of things they've done to you. But love keeps no record of wrongs. Maybe for you, you'll start being more patient with your parents when they ask you to do something that you don't want to do. Maybe whenever you do this, you'll start to see that you won't feel so arrogant just to think that you're actually always right. You'll end up being the kind of sibling to someone else that they really need even when they bother you. You'll choose not to dishonor others like your stepmom whenever you're in conflict. And so just pick one, go for it. Because even if you wouldn't call yourself a church person or a Jesus follower, being more kind and patient or more slow to anger will absolutely help your family. And if you're somebody who would say that you have faith, love is the best way to demonstrate it. Jesus said so himself. See, family is important and faith is important too. And I hope now you see that those two things absolutely mix. Loving your family is actually one of the greatest ways that you can build your faith. Now, when you go to small group, talk about some ways that you can show your family love. Because when it comes to the relationships that are thicker than water, love is more important than anything.